from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson with you. On the slate today, K-State's Craig Rosabone will look at the effect of delayed planting on corn yields. He'll go over K-State research on hybrid maturity and crop stress level, how those factor into the performance of corn planted in early to mid-June. Also today, highlights from this week's Cattle Chat podcast out of the Beef Cattle Institute here at K-State, this time centering on several economic matters in cow-calf production. Featured there are Brad White, Bob Larson, Bob Weber, and Dustin Pendle. And later on this week's horticulture segment, K-State's Raymond Cloyd gives the go-ahead to you homeowners to treat your ornamental evergreens against bagworms. Among other lawn and garden insect topics... All that and more next on Agriculture Today. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State research and extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Thanks for tuning in. You're listening to Agriculture Today. You corn producers still frustrated about getting your planting done this year, or those of you who may be looking at replanting your drowned out corn, how late you can plant that corn and still achieve a reasonable yield worth your while. K-State Research has looked into this over the years, and there's some good information that you'll want to know about. Passing that along to us today, Cropping Systems Agronomist with Kansas State University, Craig Rosaboltman. Craig, K-State has looked at some what-if scenarios in recent years, uh, how late one can plant, and it's focusing on the hybrid maturity choices they would use for this particular approach, right? Right. Is it A typical rule of thumb with a heat-driven crop like corn is that the later you plant, advice would be to, at some point, switch to an earlier maturity because the later you go, you have fewer heat units to push that crop to full maturity. And with corn, you want to include the dry down before harvest, before you could be impacted by fall frosts. Much of the state, we have a pretty nice long growing season. And so that's why you can get by with planting corn well into June and have it mature. Now, it's not to say it won't have an impact on yields, but we have the growing season to do it. So you have the issue with the length of the growing season, but you also have the issue with when the critical pollination early grain fill period happens. Mm -hmm. And typically the approach has been in much of the state anyway, plant fairly early, get silking done in early to mid-June, so you're well on your way into grain fill by the time you hit July and early August. Beat the heat. Exactly. You're beating the heat. Now, northwest Kansas... A slightly different approach, often they beat the heat on the backside of it. They have to go through vegetative stages in the heat of the summer, and then they're filling into the the latter part of the year. But that's the part of the state that is limited on heat units anyway. And so the later we get, the potential for uh, issues arises. But there are early maturity hybrids out there, and, you know, we can talk about relative maturity or Uh, in terms of days to maturity or uh, probably a more appropriate way to compare hybrids across companies would be growing degree units. Mm -hmm. And there are hybrids in those shorter season categories that perform very well now. They've been selecting those hybrids, evaluating them in these environments, and and they have uh, fairly good yield potential. The issue is what's going to happen the rest of the growing season. How much stress will that late planted stand endure? That's right. It's a question of balancing getting enough heat to drive development, avoiding the stress associated with very high temperatures and or potential for moisture shortages later in the season. Now, much of the soil profile has been recharged almost everywhere. The question is when, how soon will it be dry enough to get into plant? And so... 
that's not to say that there won't be some periods, at least, you know, two, three, four-week periods where moisture still could be limiting later in the season once we get that corn growing. Now, the research that we're citing today that goes back a few years, but it's still valid, looked at those three scenarios, low-stress environments, early stress on the late planted stand, and a high stress, and then looked at three hybrid maturities, 100, 108, and 112-day hybrids there. When you look at those three variables on stress, which of those tend to at least be somewhat favorable for a decent yield for this crop? Yeah, just to revisit that research, that was conducted mainly in central Kansas. So all the way up in Republic County, we did have a location here at Manhattan, which depending on your perspective is maybe more northeast, but kind of the eastern edge of central Kansas. And then down at Hutchinson, which is maybe the northern edge of south central Kansas. Mm -hmm. So that's where we were looking at this. And we did this over a period of a couple of years at those three locations. And it was kind of after the fact that we sorted out the stress environments. At every location and year, what kind of a situation did we encounter? And most often it was kind of what you think of as the typical scenario where you probably want to plant early to avoid the heat beat the heat. And so the earlier you planted, the better off you were. And there was a pretty significant penalty for planting late. It's when we had early stress, and that's kind of the scenario we're setting up now, cool conditions. Maybe even if you did get it planted earlier, the corn was slow to emerge, or maybe we had some slight loss of stand. In those scenarios, there was actually a situation where yields went up. (laughs) <laughs> when we planted later, well into June. There's another set of those location years where we had a fairly benign low stress year where pretty mi- minimal impact of planting date. Yeah, as we got very late, and when I say very late, like end of June, even into early July, yes, there was a slight drop off, 20% drop off in yield. But In some years, when temperatures and moisture is just right, you can get by with it. At this point, in most locations, we're at the point where the sooner we can get in, the better. And especially depending on your location and when you can get in, it's probably time to start looking at shortening up your hybrid maturity so that you can get it to black layer and and harvest moisture uh, in time. So it's riskier, but... It's not to the point of ruling out a good yield from that later planting. That's more or less the message from that research? I would say so. Like I say, most years we had a pretty dramatic drop off, Mm -hmm. and that's where the risk comes in. And others have looked at the probability for frost damage, things like that from late planting and interaction, the interaction of late planting and hybrid maturity. And so the risk is definitely there, but There is a possibility, uh, and that's a hard thing to put a number on, but there's a possibility yet of getting a respectable yield. And and we're kind of shaping up to match up within the scenarios we discussed in that previous research for an early stress year, which resulted in reasonable yields. And, yes, yields actually increased. Overall, yields were lower than in a very favorable year, Mm -hmm. but we actually – had respectable yields with planting dates well into June. Craig, we want to mention here a couple of online resources that could be quite helpful to the grower who might be weighing these alternatives of whether or not to plant corn late. One is a tool on making those hybrid maturity decisions if one is going to sow those late, and and that's uh, something that producers will find quite beneficial. That's right. It's a, a tool hosted on the website for the uh, High Plains Climate Center out of Lincoln, Nebraska. It allows you to select a location, and for that location, then select a planting date and a hybrid maturity, and it'll generate a very uh, nice chart of what the potential corn development would be, when it will hit silking, when it will hit black layer, along with, on average, and along with a range of probabilities, either the earliest versus the latest. Along with that, it plots the uh, average 
first frost date and some of the earliest and latest dates that are out there. And so you can use that to assess the risk of planting a given hybrid maturity at your location at a certain date. What's the risk of not making it to black layer or maybe having the season cut short with an early frost? And so then you can play some what-if scenarios. Well, if I plant at this date, can I still plant 110-day hybrid? Or how much would I improve my chances of reaching maturity by dropping off to 102-day hybrid? Those kinds of scenarios. And it's a, it's a very nice tool for that. Do I need to switch hybrid maturity or not? Or when is it just too late for me to plant that corn. It'll give you a a more thorough perspective on this decision. hprcc.unl.edu. And right here at K-State on the Mesonet website, there is the Growing Degree Days page, which tracks GDDs, obviously a pivotal component in this decision, and you'd direct producers toward it as well. That's right. That's more of a retrospective tool. It will look back at previous years. And so you can track, well, what did last year look like? And it will also plot the normal, kind of what you would expect on average for a given site. And so again, you can put in different dates of planting or start dates, say, and it will uh, give a prediction of when you will reach certain growth stages for, say, a medium maturity corn hybrid, and that will allow you to put some things in context, maybe for previous years versus uh, an average year, that kind of a thing. And that is at Mesonet, M-E-S-O-N-E-T dot K-S-U dot E-D-U. There is an article on this topic, not surprisingly, in the latest Agronomy E-Update newsletter out of K-State. It was posted just this past Friday, the effect of delayed planting on corn yield covers all the information that we visited about today and more. That's at agronomy.ksu.edu. Appreciate the input, Craig. Thanks for coming over. I'm glad to do it, Eric. He is Craig Rosabome, a cropping systems agronomist at Kansas State University. You are listening to Agriculture Today. More after this break over the K-State Radio Network. Agricultural producers, landowners, and creditors, you have a partner in your legal and financial needs. Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services offers reliable, trusted information and guidance. Whether you need advice for ag credit concerns or are transitioning your operation to the next owner, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services can assist you in making sound decisions for your business. To learn more, call 800-321-3276 or visit us online. Agriculture Today continues now. Well, the team from the Beef Cattle Institute here at K-State recently gathered around the table again for another BCI Cattle Chat podcast. And this time right on the heels of an informational session they conducted for the Master Food Volunteer Program. That's sponsored by K-State Research and Extension. It provides knowledge to volunteers with interests in food, cooking, and nutrition in such subject areas as food safety, science, preparation, and preservation. Veterinarians Brad White and Bob Larson, cow-calf specialist Bob Weber, and livestock economist Dustin Pendle all gave this group insight on beef production and the cattle industry, and a fair amount of that centered on the economics of cattle production. Bob, you were talking about that today. There's a range in cow-calf profitability. When there's, you know, there's been a number of university surveys and, and USDA surveys looking at Average profitability oftentimes is not very impressive. But if you really look at the whole distribution and you look at the top, say, one-third of producers or top quarter of producers, a lot of times the profitability is is actually pretty good. And so the the challenge becomes... How to get in that top third. how How to get in that top third. And it usually involves doing a lot of little things well and avoiding big mistakes. It's, it's not really rocket science, but it's about you know using your resources wisely, just doing a lot of the, so I'm thinking more of the livestock production, but doing a lot of animal husbandry things well, avoiding big mistakes. And it's a lot of times little details that it's not that different than a, an operation that's barely breaking even, but just a few things are done well, usually on the cost side and the income side. So the income's a little better than average, cost a little below average, 
and that starts to add up to then a a decent return on on that investment. Dustin, is that what the KFMA data would support? So, they're doing a lot of little things well. Yeah, I mean, so looking at that KFMA data, which they just came out with the 2018 data, and the difference between your top third and your bottom third in terms of net returns uh, above variable cost, it was uh, 200 225 dollars positive the top third to a per head basis to a negative 220 some dollars. So it was almost a 450 dollar difference between from your top, top third, third per head per head in net. Yeah. Uh, or uh, over uh, variable expenses, so and, and, so, and then, so then yeah. gross margins, yeah. and the average would be about halfway between there. So you got right. So if the average is say zero, positive side plus two hundred, negative side minus two hundred. So that's a, that's a huge difference. And there was about a, in the terms of the the, I can't remember all the numbers. You know, thirty six percent. I think of in terms of the expenses, it was feed expense. I mean, that yeah. was the biggest driver on the expense. And, side. and I say small things, but it's not small as in unimportant. It's like really good grazing efficiency, really good uh, supplementation strategies. You know, so it's it's not it's not small as in simple, but it's it's not rocket science. It's not necessarily new technology or anything that we haven't uh, known for, for many years. Keep your feed costs low, maximize your grazing efficiency, keep your cattle healthy, keep them reproductively sound. And your feed costs are a great example. You don't keep your feed costs low by doing one thing. You graze a few more days, you feed a little bit less hay, you waste a little bit less hay by how you feed it, how you store it, all of those things. That's, that, those that, are that's the, the little things. Those are going. the little things that yeah. add In- up. Incremental. Exactly right. Incremental. Yep. Yep. Incremental. So uh, there, I, or another way to put it, there are very few home runs. So that the top third are not home run different than the middle of the pack. They are lots of singles and bunts and, and, and just a lot of things just a little bit better. Okay, so I'll bring you back to the tour. What, yes. what kind of questions, feedback did you get today? What did you learn when you visited with the Master Food volunteers? Uh, so lots of questions, uh, anywhere from tariffs mm-hmm. to questions along, you know, what like, there's such a large percentage of, at least in Kansas, of the uh, net farm income last year was a result of government payments. I mean, you're talking 55% on average of the 100 $100,000 state average net farm income, 55% of that was government payments. So that was there's some questions related to that is what's the next year going to look like? How much is going to be a result of the tariff? Um, will we as consumers, will we feel that? And of course, we're gonna, those are good questions. We're going to, we will be feeling that uh, through, through higher prices of various goods. But they were, they were a very, engaged audience they were and had very lots of engaged. had lots of interaction and feedback absolutely and, there was a lot of engagement i was i was, I was quite surprised how how much interaction and it wasn't just at the very end it was from the very first slide i mean yeah. we were we were asking questions talking but it, about it. but it wasn't hard to share with them in a in a way that we could really transfer that information because they were interested they wanted the information we could give it and and bob you talked to them you did the animal handling yeah, so I, I'm curious to see what, how did that go. Yeah, so the uh, it, it went great. I was uh, I was a little a little nervous. So we had three rotations of this group of uh, uh, master food volunteers. Which, interestingly, they, they they sort of aggregated into groups. And so my middle group was mostly from a rural background. The last group I had was everybody was from Johnson County. Um, so, you know, urban or suburban background, and so a, a really interesting kind of demographic of people that. I don't ordinarily get to interface very much, so you know I kind of count it as the you know advocacy for the day check, right? Yeah. But uh, we had a, a you know three three heifers that we'd used in some student activities that were really gentle and kind of demonstrating stockmanship and, and how we now as as beef producers spend a lot of time trying to understand both animal behavior and then how do we use that to more effectively process and manage uh, animals through handling events and you know provides a nice backdrop for discussion about animal welfare issues that we face as as an industry and, and the things we're trying to do right uh, in terms of, of animal welfare and the group was. I mean, like Dustin said, I mean, it was questions from the very beginning, really interactive. Um, these weren't like stand in the corner, um, wait for you to get done with your talk kind of folks. They were engaged. It was a, a really fun event. But that's a good point, though, is mostly what they wanted to know about is understand the process. Because it's like an industry that I'm not familiar with outside where I'd say, I, I don't really have any idea how they make a phone. Yeah. And 
I, as you go through, you could learn about all the intricacies. I don't really need to know how to make a phone. I need to know they know how to make a phone, mm -hmm. right? They know how to do what they're doing. And that's part of what we did. Do you think that's part of what we did today? I mean, they, they I were think able so. to say, okay, look Kinda at all look these under areas. The hood and yeah. See what's happening. And yeah. Since they didn't have that ag background, they didn't. They were really open minded. I thought I was surprised by that. Most of them were, you know, really curious about what we were doing and, you know, kind of how the business works. And, um, you know, nobody was, well, you guys, you know, it was, they were very open minded and, and, and engaged. And I, I really, it was a lot of fun to, to interact with them, really. So it was great, a great day on the tour today. We had a lot of good interaction. I think that was a good example of it doesn't have to be too scary, but don't be afraid to tell your story. We've said that a couple of times. Yeah. Tell your story as you go forward. A couple other things that we want to discuss. One, we changed our access to the Japanese market. So that's opened that's a up. That's good thing. Uh, that's changed. And it's basically been since 2003 when there were some restrictions there. So we see a lot of news, a lot of press releases on that. Big difference, little difference. You know, how, how much difference is that going to make for us, Dustin? Well, I think anytime we get access to additional markets or markets for some additional products, I think it's good. I've read some numbers that... They think that could be an additional $200 million annually for exports for the beef industry. So I think, yeah, anytime you can open up additional markets, it's, it's and that, definitely going to be a win. My understanding is that Japanese market tends to be kind of the higher-end middle meat steaks and, and highly marbled, that, that part of the market, which is kind of nice to grow. Because we, we actually have a pretty good supply right now, and it's kind of nice to, to be able to move some of that to a customer that wants it. And we've talked about a couple times on this show the importance of those external markets, those export markets, the, of the price of beef, and it is not just I'm exporting to Japan. It is part of each carcass that's going that, right, that right. So we, brings up yeah. the price. Yeah. And speaking of prices, as we think about, and our part of the country, along with a lot of the Midwest, has been rain-soaked, less corn planted. What do I do? If I'm a cow-calf guy, do I take any action based on this information? Do I book in my calf prices? I'm hitting you guys. I didn't ask you this question before, so I'm hitting you up on the fly to get your, what do you do? I'd probably base my advice on someone other than some guys on a podcast. <laughs> 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 but I, I think this is time to go talk to somebody with some local knowledge because you really may want to think about pricing and feed ahead of time. I mean, I'd, I'd, at, least, I'd at least start asking some of those questions because this is going to be a year that's very untypical most likely yep. so I, I would want some local expertise and and thinking uh, particularly on the feed pricing side i think there's going to be some differences yeah I mean, we're going to probably see corn prices feed prices going up and so it gets back to what do you do because it probably depends upon your individual operation size i mean if you're just a small 20 30 40 50 cow operation i don't know how much corn you purchase in a given year but uh, but it may have an impact yeah. on calf prices yeah. is which is what i would worry about so as it comes into because it'll impact feed yards which could impact calf mm -hmm. prices the counterbalance there is we've talked about the calf inventory may not be what it was so yeah. so i i will kind of agree with your balancing yeah, yeah this is this is something that there, you probably want to watch and keep could, an eye on there could be some parts of this that are supportive of calf prices and some that are negative to calf prices and i'm not sure exactly where it's going to fall yeah, absolutely. But you want to you have a plan. Some sophisticated risk management strategies might be entailed. That conversation, including K-State's Bob Larson, Dustin Pendle, Bob Weber, and Brad White. The BCI Cattle Chat podcast in full can be found weekly at beefcattleinstitute.org. That's beefcattleinstitute.org. You're tuned to Agriculture Today. Agriculture and food systems are the main drivers of the Kansas economy, but must be improved in order to feed the world's growing population. How are we going to do so? Reduce food loss, find ways to preserve grasslands, and help families stretch their dollars. Global food systems is one of the five grand challenges K-State Research and Extension is addressing. To learn more, visit www.ksre.ksu.edu. You're tuned in to Agriculture Today. 
From Kansas State University, Eric Atkinson here. And now today's agricultural news headlines for you. These courtesy in part of DTN. Global grain consumption will grow faster than supply in the 2019-20 season. That's according to the International Grains Council. They announced today a combination that would squeeze inventories for a third straight year. The intergovernmental organization forecast that grain consumption would rise 1.2 percent from the year prior, driven by a 1.5 percent increase in industrial grain usage. Total grain supply, that would be a combination of production and the previous year's stockpiles, would be expected to grow, however, by only 0.4 percent. As a result, the IGC said that grain inventories will continue to run down, falling by 2.4 percent at the end of the 1920 season. Evidence that demand is strengthening relative to supply could bolster the rally we've seen in crop prices, ignited by weather-related disruptions in the Midwest. The IGC stressed that its supply and demand forecasts for the coming year are tentative, especially for soybeans, which are highly exposed to the U.S.-China trade dispute. And the organization forecasts that international trade in grains will rise 1% in 1920 from the year earlier. It said that trading volumes will slightly exceed their 2017-18 peak, mainly as a result of higher shipments of wheat and barley. The USDA secretary provided his take on what it would take time-wise to have the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement approved by Congress this year. Here's more from the USDA's Rod Bain. With the recent lifting of tariffs by the U.S., Canada, and Mexico, it appears the USMCA trade agreement took another step towards consideration among the legislative bodies of the three North American nations. The question remains when USMCA might be considered by the House of Representatives for a vote. Agriculture Secretary Sonny Perdue talking with reporters in New York State Wednesday set for ratification of USMCA by Congress by the end of this year to take place. Based on the congressional schedule, we absolutely need to have this happen before the August recess. The longer it lingers out there, the more difficult it is, and we hopefully can get it done this summer. Secretary Purdue added that when you compare USMCA to the present North American Free Trade Agreement, overall it is an improvement for agriculture and U.S. ag trade. We didn't get everything we wanted. My guys in the southeast didn't get perishable fruit and vegetable items that they would like, but they didn't have it before either. It's not going backward. It goes forward in almost every respect. I'm Rod Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. The impact of China's African swine fever outbreak has grown as the disease arrived in one of the country's largest production areas, while pork stockpiles there are rapidly falling as well. The Ministry of Agriculture and Rural Affairs in China announced this week that an African swine fever case was found in Bobai County, that's in South China's Guangxi province. It was just one hog infected within a small farm, but that location created immediate concerns for the industry. Another outbreak was reported last Saturday on a farm in Yunnan province, another other southern China province. Bobai County is one of the largest hog producing counties in China. That county typically has stocks of 500,000 sows and produces 6.2 million head of hogs annually. In the U.S., such production would rank Bobai County behind only Iowa, North Carolina, and Minnesota for hog production. According to an industry expert who asked to may, uh, remain anonymous, the situation is getting worse in South China. Hog stocks in Guangdong and Gongzai provinces have left only less than half of the pig population there. The Ministry of Agriculture said its sow herd in China is 22 percent smaller than at the same time last year, but many in the industry think that number could be more like 30 percent. Of course, African swine fever does not harm humans. It is deadly to pigs. There is no vaccine or cure yet. Government officials have now started testing all pork stockpiles in China for possible contamination. The industry is expecting a pork shortage in China in the second half of the year. Imports will be the only help to China to fill the market demand for pork. Currently, the USDA shows 122,000 metric tons of pork sales to China this year, 72,000 metric tons already shipped. In the U.S., the pork industry and the USDA officials, meantime, have ramped up efforts to keep ASF out of this country. Officials testifying earlier this month that biosecurity and import controls have been increased, although they acknowledge that ASF would be a difficult disease to control.
Next up on Agriculture Today, this week's Kansas Soybean Update. Here's Greg Akagi. Jordan Hildebrand with the Kansas Wheat Commission is joining us. And Jordan, the National Festival of Breads is coming up on June 8th in Manhattan, Kansas. It's a fantastic day full of fun for anybody who likes to eat. So what are some of the highlights for this year's National Festival of Breads? We have a a live baking competition, very much like you would see on Food Network or television stations like that. So you get to watch the finalists bake their bread, and you get to see the judges judge them at the end of the day. It's an exciting day, but we also have several baking demonstrations with a lot of exciting people, including Charlene Patton with the Kansas Soybean Commission. So she will be presenting at about 11 o'clock talking about how to bake with young families and how to get some intergenerational mixing in the kitchen, if you will. So can people attend the National Festival of Breads on June 8th? Absolutely. It's a free event for the public. We just ask that you bring a canned item for the uh, Harvester's Food Network. So it's a great day. We've got activities for the whole family. We've even got our own kids activity area where kiddos can mix up pizzas in a bag as well as face painting and, and a bunch of fun stuff that the entire family will have a really great time with. We have this partnership with the Kansas Soybean Commission, which we really value. They have been sponsors of the National Festival of Bread since 2013. And so it's a really great way for both of the commissions to partner together on a national scale. And so bakers from all around the country learn about the versatility of soybean products, especially in their baking. And so this year, the Kansas Soybean Commission Special Award were the Lucky Five Spice Cloverleaf Rolls created by Shauna Havey in the Blogger Division and the Sicilian Starbread developed by Brenda Watts uh, in the Home Baker Division. And what's really exciting is both of those award winners are actually finalists in the contest as well. So Brenda will be taking her uh, Sicilian star bread up to the finalist level and will be baking that off in Manhattan. But Shauna Havey, while her cloverleaf rolls are delicious, she will actually be baking another recipe in Manhattan. So there's still a pretty good chance that a soybean creation will end up being the uh, National Festival of Bread's champion, but we will announce that on June 8th, and we'd love to see everybody there. And they can go to the website to get more information? Absolutely. NationalFestivalOfBreads.com. We've got a whole schedule packed full of uh, exciting items that people can take a look at. Jordan, we appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Thank you. That is Jordan Hildebrand with the Kansas Wheat Commission, who joins us on the Kansas Soybean Update. It's brought to you by the Kansas Soybean Commission. Thanks, Greg. And this is Agriculture Today. Did you know every Kansas farmer feeds 128 plus people? Kansas farmers are hard workers, dependable, authentic, and sensitive. Not only do farmers put food on your table, but they put clothes on your back and fuel in your car. For more information about Kansas farmers, visit K-State Research and Extension online or stop by your local Extension office. This message has been brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. Next up for you on this Agriculture Today, our weekly horticulture segment, and Mike's side once more is horticultural entomologist Raymond Cloyd of K-State Research and Extension. We have several insects active now that we want to bring to the attention of you homeowners and gardeners. And Raymond, we brought these up last time, but we need to revisit them for they're rather abundant right now. Ants are on the move. Anything out of the ordinary here? What are you hearing? Well, basically, uh, what we're hearing is a lot of ants coming into the home, Eric, and that's probably due to all the wet, wet weather we've had. They're moving in, looking for dry places like anybody else would after it gets wet So, because they their nests are in the ground. So what you want to do in this case is to put out like an ant bait. Taro has a really good ant bait. It's one of the boric acid baits. Put it out there, and the workers will grab the bait and take it back to the colony and feed it to the, the uh, queen and the soldiers. It's a slow process, but um, you can kill a lot of those workers. But the problem is a queen can lay over 35,000 eggs, and so it's pretty mute point. But if you have house plants that you're watering, you may maybe cut back on that a little bit because they'll also go after the moisture too. But they're coming in the home because of the really saturated wet conditions uh, we've had uh, recently. And they'll enter any available crack or crevice in the home foundation or 
floor joists, wherever it might be. Yeah, and, and that's obviously one of the recommendations is caulking and sealing, but that can be very almost impossible to get every one. But any opening, crack or crevice, window seal, whatever, uh, going in, coming through drains or whatever, they'll find a way to get in if they want to. But yeah. the baits will take care of them by and large, the, eventually. The, <laughs> the baits are, are more effective than just trying to spray and kill all those ants that are crawling around, yeah. Well, the other thing, Eric, I was going to make a point is if you have house plants that have aphids or scale or sucking insects, and those are insects that exude a substance called honeydew. It's a sticky, clear liquid. Ants are attracted to that too. So if you do see ants in your home and they're near the house plants, look for aphids or mealybugs or scales because those are insects that exude this material that is attractive to ants. All right. Be on the lookout. Ants are on the move as our our soils are so soaked up right now around our home foundations. They're looking for safe harbor indoors. Well, Raymond, for weeks you have been coaxing homeowners to be patient, hold off on any treatments to their evergreens against bagworms. Although the questions you say have been coming in about doing so with regularity... Well, at long last, you tell us we are at the point where folks can pull the trigger, so to say, and uh, get after their bagworm control program. Yes. Uh, the eggs, larvae will hatch from the eggs, and they'll start crawling around. That's when they're most susceptible to these insecticides that are commercially available, Eric. So we do, again, I've stressed this before, recommend, because not all eggs hatch simultaneously, you have to make probably three to four applications, one application per week, to really knock the bag room down. That's what I did last year, uh, beginning of June. Uh, my Arbovita thuya and then junipers were getting loaded like everybody's with bagworms, and I use a product with spinosad as the active ingredient. A weekly application for four weeks, my thuyas and junipers were clean, the plants came back, and I had no issues with bagworms. If you check our newsletter, we'll have articles in there about, you know, it's time to go out there with the, with your materials for bagworms. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And remember, you have to get thorough coverage of all plant parts and make those uh, multiple applications within about a four-week period. Now... The proliferation of ticks has uh, started to catch a few folks' attention out there. These are really quite numerous, and the wet weather probably had something to do with that. Yeah, what's really happened is the the vegetation, the wet weather. We have grass and vegetation, and, of course, the ticks latch on to vegetation. When somebody goes by, a a human or animal, that's what they they latch on. So so, uh, a couple of caveats. First of all, stay away from wooded grassy areas or mow them down or weed eat them down. Uh, be sure to wear a repellent like DEET is, is one, of, one of the widely used repellents, and it is effective against ticks. Remember, that the first, second instar nymphs are, are very difficult to see. So have somebody check you over. Wear white socks. If they're crawling, you'll see them. But those are some of the, the recommendations because once the tick female is embedded, then it's basically you just you know take your time, pull it out with tweezers, but you try to avoid having them, the females, uh, feeding on you and engorging the blood, and you'll see them get larger. So it's try to be more preventative than reactive. At one point or the other, every year, ticks make their presence known. Folks ask about what they can do, even to the point, Raymond, of you getting questions about aerial treatments against ticks, say, in a backyard. Are those practical whatsoever? Really not, Eric. And, you know, it's like the mosquito. Uh, we call them blanket applications. And mm-hmm. you're probably doing more detrimental to the environment by killing the beneficials, pollinators and bees, than you are actually killing the mosquitoes or ticks. Another thing you can do is if you can drag a white carpet over the area, that will also give an indication of the tick population. Uh, if, if you have a dog, check your dog, especially if they're outdoors on a regular basis. But it boils down to common sense is the repellents if you're going to go out there. Stay away from uh, woody, unmanaged areas as much as possible. If you do that, come back and take a warm shower. Check yourself over for ticks at that point. But if you do have a tick get on you, uh, get identified because we do have ticks that vector diseases. The American dog tick vectors, Rocky Mountain spotted fever. And, of course, the deer tick or black-legged tick is the vector for Lyme disease. And also, if you've heard the news, the Lone Star tick is the vector of that uh, alpha galactase, and that's the one that causes meat allergies. And so take tick seriously. If you do get one on you, you have it identified. So you, have the, you know what it is and uh, can take the precautionary 
remedies to deal with it after that. And your extension personnel available here at K-State and through your local offices mm-hmm. can help you with that identification. Absolutely. Yeah. Just get into a routine of protecting yourself every time you venture out and, right. and be alert to ticks and their potential for latching onto you or your kids, your pets. Raymond, we'll have you back soon. Thanks for the update, as always. I enjoy it very much, Eric. Look forward to seeing you. Likewise. Raymond Cloyd, horticultural entomologist, K-State Research and Extension. That is our horticulture segment for this week. Incidentally, we would encourage you to take advantage of the weekly horticulture newsletter out of K-State. It covers a wide array of topics on lawn and garden care, landscaping and ornamentals. It's a quite timely informational resource, and you can find it simply by going to the K-State Extension Horticulture website or just search for K-State Horticulture Newsletter. And don't forget our podcast service as one listening option you might want to look into. To do so, go to this website, agtoday.net. That's agtoday.net. All the details can be found there. Meantime, please rejoin us right here this same time tomorrow. Eric Atkinson here. This has been Agriculture Today over the K-State Radio Network.